Hello biologists, this is one of the last beautiful days in September and we're going to review 105 and 109 scientific processes and the characteristics of life. We first talked about in unit one scientific methods and a lot of diagrams you see have straight lines from collect data and they put these in order but I purposely put these out of order so that you can understand that it's not always a linear process. Sometimes you have data and then you form a hypothesis. Sometimes you make observations after you collect data. But usually you ask a question first, like in this diagram here. And then you might make observations or form a hypothesis. Which step usually comes before an experiment? Well, an experiment, you test the hypothesis. So before you design and perform an experiment, you want to form a hypothesis. You kind of want, you, you have a question in mind, and you think you know the answer based on what other scientists have done or research that you've done on the internet, or you've read scientific papers, or research that you've previous experiments that you've done. So one experiment that they talked about in the book was barn swallows and making their tails a different length. They noticed, scientists noticed, that barn swallows have really long tails and they wanted to know whether this had to do with flying or mating or both. So their question in the experiment they talked about in the chapter was really about mating. Are male barn swallows with longer tails more likely to mate? And you can measure if they mate because you can look at the genetic evidence for um, if their genes get passed on to their babies. So what they did to manipulate variables in this experiment as scientists do, they change certain variables in an experiment. They wanted to change the length of the tails. So they made a control group, a, a group where they didn't change anything, and then in the experimental group, they took they took a barn swallow, they chopped off the tail and put in longer tail feathers. So they made an experimental group that had longer tail feathers. That was the deep, the, uh, the independent variable was the length. And they, what they did is they glued the longer tail feathers on there and they were a little worried that the glue was going to be really smelly and females wouldn't like the guys that smelled like glue. So uh, one of the groups, they cut off the tail feathers and they glued them back on so they were exactly the same length, but one group had glue and one didn't. So they had a number of controls in this experiment. So they collected data on how much the different males with different lengths uh, of tail feathers mated. They got a bunch of data. They might have put it in a spreadsheet. This experiment was done a long time ago, so they might not have had spreadsheets. They might have just had paper with a bunch of numbers on it. And they had to figure out what the, all those numbers meant. So they sat down and they analyzed their data. They made graphs, maybe charts or tables. They maybe did statistics on it. They found the mean, median, mode, or they asked questions with t-tests or ANOVAs. You don't need to know what those are. But they really, they worked with their data to try to understand what all the numbers they collected meant. You, of course, don't always just have to collect quantitative data here you can collect qualitative data that has description. So they probably also describe some of the mating behavior, what the females did when they came up to the males, 
the color of the females. Maybe they describe the smell of the glue. Those are all descriptive data, and that's qualities, qualitative data. Quantity, where they're asking how much, how many, how often, and they're dealing with numbers, that's quantitative data. So that's one, quiz 105. You should have enough information to take quiz 105. Quiz 109 is about the characteristics of life. All living things have these characteristics. They have cellular organization. They maintain homeostasis. They use energy or metabolize energy. They respond to their surroundings. They grow. They develop. They reproduce. And they inherit characteristics from their parents, which is heredity. Let's talk a little bit about cellular organization. All living things are made of cells. You can have one cell and just be a unicellular organism, or you can be like this organism and be multicellular. Cellular ha cells have membranes, and they have a nucleus, which you can't see in this picture because I chose plant cells, which have a lot of chloroplasts here. Chloroplasts are the green things that uh, where photosynthesis happens in a cell. Not all cells have these green things, just plant cells. Maintain homeostasis means try to maintain a balance of different qualities in the body, like humans try to maintain blood sugar. It goes up after we eat because we absorb uh, glucose from our food. It goes down if we haven't eaten in a while, and our body regulates itself with insulin and glucagon to try to maintain a normal level of sugar. Same with our temperature. We're sweat with the, we're hot, we shiver if we're cold. We're trying to maintain a stable temperature. Living things also respond to their surroundings. Dogs pant when they're hot. If it's hot out and they're sitting in the sun, they'll pant. Plants grow towards the light. This is called phototrophism. We don't think of plants responding, but over time they do. They will grow towards the window. Notice how this plant doesn't have any leaves over here, and all the leaves are on the window side. Living things also use energy, or they metabolize glucose and other molecules. This cheetah here is metabolizing a lot. Plants also metabolize the glucose that they produce in photosynthesis. Um, if they're in the dark, especially, they're not making any glucose, they're just using it. So they metabolize their own glucose. They break down that glucose for energy. Everything grows, including you. You probably had one of these growth charts when you were a kid. You also develop. You not only get bigger, but you change. Uh, polywogs are a great example of this. A frog starts out looking like this, and it eventually ends up with legs and no tail. So that's an uh, example of development. Reproduce. Cats have kittens. They make more of themselves. Sunflowers and other plants make seeds. That's how they make baby plants. So organisms reproduce. Bacteria also reproduce. Fungi reproduce with spores. And other, all organisms make more of themselves. Heredity. You look like your parents. Whether you're a tomato or a piglet, you're going to look like the organisms whose offspring you are. So if you're a pig, you're not going to look... If your parents were pigs, you don't look like a kitten. So let's talk a little bit about what metabolism is. We see a bunch in this picture here, we see a bunch of chemical reactions. Um, you can do addition reactions, you can separate a compound, you can add other compounds and make substitution reactions, but basically all of the reactions are an organism are going to be its metabolism.
Frogs, frogs respond to colder weather coming by burying themselves in the mud. Is this an example of a characteristic of life? Are they responding to the environment? As it gets colder, they bury themselves in the mud. If you have blue eyes and your parents have blue eyes, this is an example of what? Just the idea that your eyes look like your parents, even if they're not the same color. Your eyes do not look like your dog's eyes, or a zebra eye, or a frog eye. So, we talked a little bit in class about the organization of cells. And we said cells organize themselves into tissues. This is a good example of a plant tissue. You can see all the similar types of cells here, similar types of cells here, and similar types of cells here. We also talked about structure and function. The structure of a body part relates to the function of that part. So, for example, the esophagus is a hollow organ. It's basically a tube and its function is to deliver food. So its structure relates to the function. If abiotic factors, the non-living factors in an ecosystem, change drastically, for example, there's an oil spill or climate change, is this, an, this is a result of this an example of this, but it happens more slowly, of course, than, than an oil spill. Organisms are going to respond to that change in their environment. How are they going to respond? And that's it. Thanks for coming.